Pretending to write? Pretending to write? Hello everyone, my name is Kevin Healy. I write about plants at pullupyourplants.com where we explore the human-plant relationship going back through history. Sometimes these explorations take us to strange places. While researching sorghum bicolor, aka sorghum or guinea corn, I learned of its role in warding away a really disturbing folk vampire in Jamaica called the Sukoyant, or the Hag. The Hag was a type of she-demon vampire who required to tear off her skin before flying into your home as a ball of flame. She would then appear as a sinuous, degloved living anatomy model before she drank from your arteries, leaving you a dry, mummified husk that was frozen in horror. I was excited to talk about it until I realized that my source was from a problematic time in history. I reached out to Jamaican Reddit and left with a sense that the legend may be getting left behind in the rearview mirror of history somehow. But you know, I'm not the guy to bring this back. I needed an expert and boy did we find one. We are about to hear from THE expert, Dr. Giselle Lisa Anatol. She has a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, an undergraduate from Yale. She's a current professor and director for the study of science fiction at the University of Kansas. She's the immediate past president of the Association for Caribbean Women Writers and Scholars, and she literally wrote the book on the hag. So after reading her book, Things That Fly in the Night, Female Vampires and Literature of the Circum-Caribbean and African Diaspora, highly recommended, Dr. Anatol was kind enough to speak with us. Let's hope I didn't make her regret it. My name is Giselle Anatol, and I am a professor uh, in the English department at the University of Kansas, uh, the Lawrence campus. And I um, have been uh, here, I now I, <laughs> well, coming to um, KU, I had, it was my first time to the Midwest, so I did not anticipate staying very long. Um, I grew up on the East Coast. Uh, my parents are immigrants. Um, I was the first one in my family to be born in the States. Um, so, you know, aunts, uncles, grandparents, everyone born in Trinidad, born and raised in Trinidad. And so I had not been, I had been west of the of pretty much of Philadelphia um, <laughs> uh, to visit some friends from college on the West Coast, but I'd never been to the Midwest. And so um, it was a new experience, but I've come to call it home. Um, and so I, uh, when I came to KU, I was really excited that there were already um, Caribbean literature courses on the, on the books. And um, so I could jump right in. Uh, KU also has a vibrant, um, Institute uh, for Haitian Studies and is one of the few college campuses where uh, Haitian Creole can be um, learned as, um, as a language, like for foreign language study. Um, so it's been a really great place. And we also have um, terrific holdings in the Spencer Museum of Art, um, a really sizable Haitian art um, portfolio um, collection and um, and lots of other art that's uh, that I've used in my classes, and so it's been um, really great for my for my kind of thinking and and writing um, and research. Um, my my training um, was in Caribbean women's writing, uh, and my so my dissertation was on representations of motherhood in uh, in Caribbean and Caribbean diaspora literature. Um, uh, but I also had uh, for a long time uh, an interest in children's literature. Uh, so when I arrived at KU, I taught, I've been teaching courses in children's literature, um, kind of multicultural ch children's literature and uh, Caribbean um, literature, some African-American um, and multicultural <laughs> American literature classes. Um, and so my research from mother on motherhood um, was, kind of my formal study for a while, but I've always been really captivated by this figure of the Sukriyant. And um, as I was kind of going through my career, um, I wrote a couple of articles um, about the, the folklore and um, I kept on kind of digging up more references and uh, someone said, well, you know, um, maybe for getting tenure, a book on vampires would not be kind of respected um, as real scholarship. And so I kind of put it off for a while, um, but it just kept on calling me. And so um, eventually um, I 
published uh, this work, The Things That Fly in the Night. Fantastic. It's great to hear that you're able to follow your passion, you know, where it led you. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, we were really little and um, this this aunt loved kind of horror stories. <laughs> and um, so I think it's, it's um, it, you know, she would, um, I'm, and I can't even remember now if the first time was us seeing the scar and saying, how did you get that? Um, and her, um, she had a, a tremendous uh, imagination and she was also a great repository of folk, Trinidadian folk stories. Um, so she would tell us the stories of, you know, occasionally, um, so my sister and I, before my brother was born, um, we would spend summers in Trinidad. And so um, she had two kids who were the same age, ages um, of me and my sister. Um, and uh, so we would uh, spend part of the time with my dad's mother, my grandmother, who also told us um, a few stories. Um, but um, Auntie Yoland, uh, when we stayed with her, she would uh, kind of regale us with these various stories. So she would tell us about the Dwen, um, who are um, little, um, they're small, they look like um, children or babies, um, and they wear these big hats and their feet are on backwards. Um, so they can kind of lure you, um, you might see a up, you might see tracks in the woods and kind of follow them thinking you're following someone, but the tracks um, are um, designed to get you very confused and kind of lost in the woods. Um, and those are supposedly, um, the Dwen come from um, unbaptized babies. I later later learned she didn't include that part in her story. Um, it was mainly about don't follow strangers into the woods. <laughs> um, and um, she would tell us stories of um, La Jablesse, um, which was also horrifying um, to me. And um, she and my Auntie Joan, I remember, told us a story about the, how the La Jablesse chased our Uncle Earl um, or kind of seduced, uh, lured him um, because she looks like a very beautiful woman and then lured him out for a walk late at night. Um, and then he could hear the clip clop because the La Jablesse has one human leg and then one goat, goat leg, goat foot or cow foot, depending on the storyteller. Um, and um, so, and the story about the scar on her leg, you know, she would say, this is where the Sukuyant, when I was um, younger, it would come and suck my blood. And, you know, this is where it, it bit me. And the story, that story and the story that, that we were told about our uncle Earl were really, um, I mean, they really um, made an imprint, I think, because there was an interweaving of the kind of the fantasy and the folk uh, lore, the creative aspects that even as children, we could tell, you know, that this, that this is, um, these folk tales are not necessarily to believe, like there's some doubt, like, okay, can someone really have a goat foot? Um, but you want to believe as, as children and, um, and, um, but by kind of integrating themselves into the stories, it added an element of reality um, in a way that I think made the folk tales resonate um, in ways that they must have resonated in earlier times for people who didn't have the scientific knowledge to know, um, to as easily distinguish those lines between um, kind of what was um, scientifically logical and then what was fantasy. Um, and, and, you know, that element of, um, of believing and this, this I think adds to the strength of the story to stay with you um, and provide interesting lessons. Um, you know, sometimes negative, sometimes positive, depending on how you read them and what you take from them. Um, but uh, I think, uh, and allows them to be remembered and then told um, to other people and in later generations. Sure, oh man, <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. And I could see from the perspective of a kid how that would be horrifying, kind of like, a Santa Claus where you believe, but also horrifying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. And I think, you know, we could think about it in terms of Santa Claus, you know, so you believe, um, and then maybe when you stop believing, maybe there's the, it's the evidence of the cookies, right? The cookies were there and then the cookies are gone. So what, you know, someone ate the cookies and so it must be Santa Claus, right? And then it's only later that you kind of put together, oh, wait a minute, my parents could have eaten the cookies, right? Um, or your parents tell you, or oh, oh, we ate the cookies, right? Um, so, um, right, the, the, those the ways that we, um, that we kind of ground these stories um, to, 
um, allow greater um, enjoyment too, right? Um, yeah, in our lives. What other names has the Silkiant gone by? Uh, and uh, where were the stories most prevalent? Right, so um, in my research, and so what's interesting, um, I'm so glad that you have brought the, these um, new, um, new references to me. So when I first started, it was really, um, you know, the, I st started writing about the Sukuyan in, um, like in an academic setting in a graduate course in the 1990s. And so we didn't have access to, you know, Google search. <laughs> um, and so it wasn't as easy to, um, to find references and um, different examples of the story. Um, and so a lot of it was by word of mouth and just kind of painstaking, you know, just going through pages of, of materials. Um, and what makes it tricky is that the Sukuyan is, um, so I had, always, when it was spelled for me in my family, it was S-O-U-C-O-U-Y-A-N-T. But because it's an oral tale, it can be spelled in, when it was taken down by different writers, um, it was spelled in different ways. So sometimes the spelling, I've seen the spelling S-U-S-U-K-U-G-N-A-N. Um, uh, there's also Sucrian, um, S-O-U-C-R-I-A-N-T. Um, and, uh, so we see a lot of different variations in spelling because of the, the transcription, the transcription process. Um, and then on top of that, um, in Trinidad, we use the word Luga, um, Lagahu for um, um, usually a man who is um, a, ma a kind of magic wielder, sometimes an obia, uh, obia man um, who has the power, shape shifting power, and so can turn into like a wolf um, or a big dog at night um, and a, a, a kind of malicious figure. Um, uh, like the, in the werewolf tradition. Um, and I think that uh, Lagahu maybe comes from Lugaru um, in uh, French, uh, or maybe um, a European um, listener to uh, the story assumed that there was that connection and then um, put that name on it. So there are all of these kind of really tangled webs about naming. Um, but in Haiti, um, uh, Lugaru, is um, can also refer to the skin shedder, um, the skin shedder and the blood sucker. So there's that crossover there. Um, there's uh, in Haiti and in the French speaking Caribbean, the San Piel, which means without skin, um, is is a figure that resembles the Sucriant. Um, there's the volant, uh, volant um, who flies about in the night, sucks blood. Um, in the French speaking Caribbean, um, in Suriname, when I was giving a paper, some of the women in the audience, this was an association of Caribbean women writers and scholars conference. Um, and some of the, the audience members, when I was describing the Sukuyant, kind of started tittering and in the question and answer, they said, we have that here too. It's called, you know, Azaman. And so um, it's, in, and then when I was reading um, Folklore by Zora Neale Hurston, I saw references to um, women and men in her versions who can peel their skin and fly in the night. Um, and um, it, her version's called the, the figure the hag um, or the old hag. And we see that connection with Jamaica and um, Guyana. Um, so the hag or haig, um, depending on pronunciation, old haig, um, old higgy. Um, different pronunciations depending on the on the community. Um, but again, um, we see these figures throughout the diaspora, the African diaspora. Um, and uh, my research showed that there were also um, among the Akan people in West Africa, the Obayafo um, was um, um, a witch or um, kind of magical mystical figure who um, could shed their skin, hit it in some kind of um, object like the Sukuya hides her skin um, in the um, mortar. Um, and and um, the Obayafo also turned into kind of a little ball of light to um, fly about the community and then suck the souls or suck the blood of neighbors. So, um, uh, and again, as I discuss in my book, it's not really clear 
whether those stories originally um, in, were initiated in Africa and then traveled with um, captives, um, enslaved people to the um, Americas and then got dispersed that way. Um, but there were also um, in the Caribbean, there were people who left the Caribbean to go to Africa um, for um, various reasons. So the stories might have died out in a place and then be rekindled or um, so there's a lot of back and forth. Um, how did the uh, Suquiant tale help to perpetuate the fear of women's social mobility, power and sexuality? Sure. Um, I think, you know, um, in various cultures, we have stories of like the boogeyman, right? And that's meant to kind of, um, I think in contemporary versions, um, scare children into being good, <laughs> to, to say it very kind of bluntly and, and quickly, um, the short version, um, right? So if you're not good, um, you know, the boogeyman might get you, right? Um, uh, and, you know, dozens of variations. Um, and in a lot of cultures, we also have stories um, and a lot of fear of old women. Um, so hags and witches in lots of cultures. So um, from um, Hansel and Gretel, right? The witch living alone in her house who um, might um, eat children or in Russian culture, Baba Yaga, right? Might be seen as a, um, a fearsome because of her power, but also, um, but not necessarily in that stark dichotomy of good versus evil, right? That there's more nuance there um, and more kind of flexibility. Um, but so the, the Sukuyant, again, um, because she is a demonic figure, right, and not um, in traditional tales, um, right, you never want to encounter her. Um, she is, um, it's a way to demonize certain behaviors, right? So I would say in cases where this, the, the hag figure can be male or, fig or female, then there's um, not so much of a targeting of women's behaviors, but in cultures where, um, like the one I grew up in where the Sukoyant is always a woman, always a, an, and always an old woman. I think it teaches women, it teaches people to be afraid of um, women and especially women who live alone um, uh, because they might be um, Sukoyant, you never know, right? And especially if those women are not taking care of others, right? So not taking care of children or a husband and, or of, um, of the community and uh, kind of integrated into the community. Um, and I think there's also an interesting kind of connection to poverty um, because there is the sense that the, the Sukoyant lives in a house that's often kind of run down. Um, there are weeds in the garden or the grass is overgrown um, and it's kind of off, you know, kind of off on the outskirts of, of town. So this kind of um, uh, denigration of, um, of, women who cannot, um, who refuse um, to uh, participate in the, um, the roles that are, um, that are usually dictated, right, by society as what good women do, right? Good women are um, always social, they're, um, they're nurturers, they, um, they take care of others, they, uh, they give, right? And if we think about it and like really like kind of extend the metaphor. Um, they are they give um, milk right when they're um, they're nursing, um, so that they give fluid. They don't take fluid, right? So that idea of a woman who's taking fluids and life fluids from others, um, it would be seen as um, especially um, especially dangerous and fearful. Um, um, uh, and I think that that notion of penetration. So in a lot of scholarship that's um, in scholarship about vampires generally, the idea of the, um, the penetrating bite is often read as a metaphor for kind of sexual penetration. So the notion of a woman who penetrates versus um, being penetrated, right? That idea of kind of standard missionary position in terms of sexuality, right? She's not obeying the rules of, um, of a good woman. And so all of these things kind of fit together um, to show us, um, uh, the people who listen, what behaviors um, should be um, kind of commended um, and um, sought out if you're a man looking for a woman um, or um, what uh, behaviors um, should be um, kind of rooted out, right? Um, 
from, from different communities. Yeah, I think so. You, um, the the Sukhyant stories, as they get recorded um, in um, different documents um, over over the centuries um, and different generations, you know, there are examples that we have from um, European um, slave um, owners or. Uh, European travelers in the region um, who say, oh, listen to these stories that the um, African population in the Caribbean is telling, right? So they're kind of recounting these stories and these, um, they become part of, um, you know, diaries and travelogues and, um, and different collections of um, African, um, African Caribbean folk culture. Uh, and often there is um, there's a way that the that the tellers um, until um, folks like um, Roger Abrams or Elsie Clues Parsons are um, try to be um, just collectors, um, but before that we are there are those stories are used to show and kind of demonstrate. Oh, look, these people are so ignorant, or these people are so foolish and superstitious. Um, then there, uh, there's a period where there are just collections to kind of make sure these stories aren't forgotten. Um, but then, um, and then they kind of fall out of um, the public view. Um, I think then um, in, po in kind of during the independence movements in the mid uh, 20th century, um, a lot of folks um, start kind of rejecting the notion that European culture is the best, right? That European culture is superior and any African um, cultures are inferior, Caribbean, African Caribbean cultures are inferior. Um, and they say, we need to um, kind of remember the ways of our, of our ancestors and really celebrate um, their beliefs and their traditions. Uh, and so there is a move to, um, to reteach those stories um, to children so that they're not forgotten. So children in schools um, in um, to kind of recreate um, images. Uh, uh, so there are painters um, who start um, using uh, figures like Sukuyant, La Jablesse, um, Papa, Papa Lo, um, uh, uh, Mama Lo, um, and Papa Bois. Um, so all of these folk figures um, in, um, in murals, in um, art that's put up in um, museums, right, national museums. Um, and so that it really then gets tied to um, we should be proud of our heritage, proud of our culture, um, and seeing those connections um, with other, um, so not just in the context of Trinidad, but also making it um, about connections to Africa and African culture. So we see a lot of that, you know, Black is Beautiful, Black Pride movements in the 1970s in the United States, um, but in the, the 50s and the 60s um, in the Caribbean, um, that really comes into, into full force. Cool. Um, as far as like seizing the archetype and turning it into something a little bit more positive and motivating, uh, you mentioned a whole lot of uh, books in here, um, and you and you did great analysis on them. Analyses. Um, <laughs> on them. <laughs> are there are there any um, are there any uh, authors of the African diaspora today? Uh, or in the African Americas uh, that you would recommend? Any uh, entry-level books that would be a good uh, entry into the, the story of the Sukuyan? Yeah, I think my kind of re, um, kind of the first time um, that I saw, I think, well, starting in like the, in the eighties, right? That that is when um, Caribbean women's literature, real, there's a boom. Um, there have been Caribbean women writers who are published and, um, and recognized um, for decades before, um, but there um, are a lot more kind of coming into the public eye and they're doing really interesting um, and kind of innovative things. And I think Nalo Hopkinson was one of the first writers um, that I recognized as um, being really invested in taking these folk figures um, and then bringing them into her literature. She's a science fiction fantasy um, writer um, and, um, and kind of doing different kinds of things 
with them. Uh, so she, her book, um, Midnight Robber, for example, I teach that in my um, Black Speculative Writers class, um, that she uses a lot of different um, pieces of uh, Caribbean uh, folklore, folk culture, um, but um, puts them in um, a futuristic um, other planetary setting. Um, and so um, really, uh, I my students um, think that often if they're not of Caribbean heritage that they think it's all kind of created and there are these different words that she's made up or um, different figures that she's made up, but she is pulling from these really deep roots that I think um, uh, that are really interesting. So Midnight Robber and then her, her first novel, Brown Girl in the Ring, um, uses uh, the Sukuyan explicitly um, and uses that as as a figure that um, that she that is employed throughout throughout the novel. So um, she, I think, is a is a is a great start. Um, Edwige Danticat, who lots of people might um, know, she's um, written in a lot of different contexts, uh, Haitian uh, Haitian American writer. Um, her short story, 1937, I think is a really terrific um, and short um, entry point to see um, that inversion that's going on. So making um, the negative aspects of the Sukuyant folk tale into um, positive attributes. Um, so that short story is found in uh, her first collection of short stories called um, Creek Crack. Um, and uh, yes, and I think that that, you know, as you're reading that story, she's using the idea of um, flight and escape metaphorically, um, uh, but she's also, but she also integrates in that story, I think uh, she's using the term volant and she might not actually use a term at all, um, but there is a character who is accused, a woman who is accused of being a Sukuyam um, and killing a neighbor's child. And so she's almost beaten to death by her community. And then she's put into um, a prison um, with other women who are accused of the same thing. Um, and this is in the year, um, 1937, and that's referring to um, the um, massacre of Haitian um, Haitian people on the Dominican side of the island of Hispaniola um, when the dictator uh, Rafael Trujillo um, was trying to kind of purge um, Haitians out of the Dominican Republic. Uh, but I find that to be a really, um, it's a very simple story, but it's very, it's very layered and really moving. Well, yeah, I have to admit when I first uh, heard of the legend of the Sukuyant, uh, just the image of someone, someone uh, just tearing their skin off in order to get into your home was horrifying, you know, I was like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know, I was like, this is uh, vampire, you know, vampirism at, a, at a, on another level, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's I was gonna, that's what I find, you know, what's really interesting is how different people latch on to different parts of the story. So you mentioned that, like I hear from my students, like what's the most horrifying part of the story? And some will say, oh my God, it's that image of like peeling off your skin. Like that sounds so painful. And then there's the gruesome, like, what do you look like when you peel the skin off like bloody mess? And then other people will say, well, I didn't really think about that part. For me, it's the idea of someone when I'm sleeping and I don't know, like coming into my room and that I don't, you know, that fear of kind of the invasion of the private space where you're supposed to be safe. And then others will say, God, no, I've always been terrified of vampires because it's the idea of the bite. Like I'm terrified of being um, bitten. It's the pain for me. Right. Um, so like, yeah, I think it's, it's really interesting how all of those things kind of tie together. But it, it, but in your book, the way um, you you kind of highlight her um, mobility, uh, ability to leave her skin, uh, live on her own, uh, travel wherever she wants to, I thought that was a, an incredible take on 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 that that legend. Whereas otherwise, it would just on a super official level, it'd just be horrifying. Yeah, you know. Um, yes. <laughs> so yeah, my entry point into this whole uh, legend. Um, I don't know if that's the right way, the right thing to call it. But, yeah. Uh, Okay, was uh, her particular, um, uh, I don't know what you call it, compulsion to pick up and calculate things. And some of actually, uh, I found a lot more references from your book since you uh, point out the many names of the Sukuyan. Mm -hmm. I was able to search uh, the archives 
for uh, more associations with Guinea corn. And um, I found that, um, I, I guess it might've been a trope that she was, the, the, uh, the, the figure might've been ignorant because in this case, uh, she would only be able to count three of them and have to start over again. So you could even have just a tiny amount and she would just be perpetually counting. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and I, I've seen, I've seen that, right. Like I had, I was not familiar with those, those versions, but I saw that too. Like that she, some stories talk about, you know, she's, um, so she's ignorant. I think that also links to poverty, right? Like who has the ability to go to school and not work right at different, different moments in history. Um, but um, the, like in some cases it's, she, uh, she can only count up to 10, um, but she can also only count odd numbers. So if you leave, um, like if you leave eight grains of rice or guinea corn in the cases that you've seen, um, she won't know what to do. So she has to keep on starting over. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, I, I, so the, 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 let me see here. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. So one thing I found interesting, just kind of, um, and I am a newbie to vampires in general, let alone this, but thanks to you. I mean, I, I know more about the soup plant than I do vampires. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. <laughs> yeah. But I, I found in, uh, in vampire legends all over the world and even hungry ghost legends in, uh, mm -hmm. in Asia uh, that this counting thing is kind of common amongst them. And, and then sometimes it's not even grains of sand. It could be uh, holes in fishing nets or something like that. I was just curious, uh, what your take on, uh, on uh, well, you kind of answered the question, uh, what your take on um, how or why she's compelled to count things, uh, a, a lack of education or, uh, uh, you know, uh, ability or um, availability of social mobility as far as education and, uh, and money and, mm -hmm. and property, it all plays in. So that does answer my question pretty well. Well, and I think it's also, so in the cases, so in, um, so the, the ones that I was more familiar with as a child, um, the, the grains, you had to put a lot down, right? So she did, it wasn't that she couldn't count. It was just that grains, it was either grains of salt or grains of rice are so small that you would put down so many, you could put down in a handful so many that it would be impossible to count in that limited amount of time. Um, so you put them at the, um, at, around the windowsills or um, at the, on the doorstep. And so there would be no way in an overnight period to be able to, to count that, that number of grains. Um, in some uh, of the stories, some of the stories, the rice is put at um, crossroads um, and that prevents her from um, leaving that spot in town and then going to any houses, like even get a, being able to approach the uh, um, other houses. Um, and a student of mine suggested um, in a class, uh, the first time I taught the class, he was saying, well, what if that too is about poverty? Like if a woman is poor and living on her own and aged and maybe can't do the labor that she once did in order to earn money and doesn't have a family to help provide food, if there's rice on the ground, she's going to pick it up, right? Because that might be something that she can eat. So again, that kind of, you know, um, that perhaps that is um, also um, a way, the story is a way to kind of demonize the poor, right? Um, and to, um, to suggest that these people um, don't have the same value or viability in a community, that they're a drain on resources rather than a kind of more compassionate, um, like, you know, we provide for the poor um, in that attitude. That's great, because um, you did mention it in the beginning, uh, somewhat near the beginning of your book about it being a little bit about poverty. And um, I, I kind of understood it, but I, I, you've helped me realize it. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, and, and I'll just just uh, just for an ending, I, I wanted I was just curious, um, and I, I could cut this out if 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 you don't have any experience. But I, the, my article is about sorghum. Um, I'm uh, researching it, and I'm doing it kind of as a sorghum suite. Like I, I have I have one about this myth that uh, Benjamin Franklin discovered sorghum and brought it to the Americas. It's most oh. <laughs> 
And matter of fact, uh, the Kansas uh, Board of Agriculture out there has a coloring sheet and on the coloring sheets, picture of sorghum, it's for kids. And at the bottom it says, Ben Franklin uh, brought sorghum to the United States. It's endemic to Africa, right? <laughs> But somehow, and the story goes, he went and it was given to him in a golden box. He had a single seed, he planted it in the ground. So I, I, I went to some lengths to dispel that myth. Um, oh, wow. That is, fa oh, wait, I can't wait to read your article. Please do send it to me when it's, when you're all done. Okay. Well, that one is done. I'll, I'll, I'll be able to send that to you pretty, uh, but it's roundly uh, false, but. Yes. Yeah. Right. But it's, I mean, it's so fascinating about how right? There are all kinds of myths that help to build up um, a nation's idea or community's idea, society's idea of who they are, right? So that idea of Benjamin Franklin as the founding father, right? Um, it's not just about, you know, like um, discovering electricity and, um, you know, establishing the first university in Pennsylvania or the first public library or all of those different things. Um, but um, that it totally displaces, like it, those stories displace indigenous people, they displace African people, they like Africa as, as you just, so I didn't know that about Sorghum. So endemic to Africa, but also the labor of the Africans who would be kind of like growing all the food in the colonies, right? Um, uh, uh, slave labor, right? That it that gets totally written out of the story to kind of celebrate and honor this kind of these white men who were the founding fathers. Oh yeah, I mean, he was given credit for discovering everything that wasn't nailed down. Um, but you know, with sorghum, it's just taking it from a vulnerable population just because it's there for the taking. And right. It was just, it was just, egregious. And there's so many academic sites that just regurgitate this, including the USDA, everything right now. Wow. <laughs> so, wow. So this, it, so I don't know anything about sorghum. So what, um, what does it, what is it good for? Like, oh, yeah, oh, it's amazing. It's a, it's kind of like a dry land sugar cane. Um, oh. where it, and it has so many forms. Uh, it used to have a, some, something like 177 different uh, 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 genus, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, genus species associated with, but uh, with uh, gene technology, we have found out that no, there are just many forms of this one plant. Some are good for making syrup. You could press it like sugar cane. Huh. Uh, they're good in uh, dry climates. Uh, out here in Colorado, it's uh, mainly being used as silage, uh, whereas it's being stored to uh, feed uh, animals, biofuel, but also the grain is used like kind of popping corn and you could, it's a huge, huge uh, food source in, in India and in Africa right now. It's a staple out there. Huh. Um, but, you know, it's something to really be explored with climate change, in my opinion, you know. Yeah. And I have some sort, I can send you some sorghum syrup if you're, if you're curious. Oh, sure. That would be great. <laughs> yeah. It's really cool. It's just like molasses, really. Um, but yeah, um, it, it, it's, it's an interesting story, but it's um, usually my plant, uh, my website and uh, um, covers uh unusual, peculiar plants uh, from my perspective, okay. say, um, and I can write, uh, you know, short stories on them. It's, it's useful. I have to dig really hard and work really hard for a very short little nugget, uh, but with like bigger crops like sorghum that are very important all over the world. Uh, it's just too huge to write this scroll that someone would have to sit through. So I'm, I'm thinking maybe I should do it like a suite and have little, you know, tidbits. Yeah, yeah that sounds great. Yeah, because I've heard, I've heard of sorghum, but I, don't know, you know, I, and now realize, you know, so, um, you know, it's a grain and there's the kernel, um, but yes, didn't know, <laughs> like, do we still, is it like buckwheat? Do we still eat it? Yes. Where does it, what do we use it for? Oh yeah. And in, 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 in Jamaica, so I found um, uh, references to Guinea corn and it's, it, it, Linnaean nomenclature was very new at the time, uh, uh, but it was really early uh, um, associated with the uh, uh, sorghum bicolor, but uh, James Madison and Thomas Jefferson uh, were conversing. They said it's, you know, huge amongst this, uh, the slaves in, mm. in Jamaica. Mm. And, uh, you know, and Benjamin Franklin himself, he, he said, I got the grain from Virginia here, uh, try some, you know, <laughs> that's the extent. Huh. But yeah, that's uh, it, fascinating. It, it was such a pleasure speaking with you. Um, uh, I wanted to add a couple things. I am also from Philadelphia. Um, oh. I'm, I'm familiar with the uh, University of Penn, your alma mater, who 
ironically, I think, didn't Ben Franklin found that or something? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he actually did though. <laughs> yeah, that was that one's real, yeah. <laughs> okay, but yeah, I was actually a parking lot attendant there for years. So it's a, it, during the, uh, 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 the relays perhaps. Uh, oh, maybe yes, yes. One of my parking lots and I handed you a ticket or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh man it's That's, been a pleasure speaking with you it really has thank you so much well thank you so much this has been a, this has been a delight for me as well um so uh thank you so much for looking me up and um and contacting me and um i loved the conversation i've learned a lot oh heck yeah so did i Jeez, <laughs> you work on it things are fine tonight female vampires in literature the circum caribbean and african diaspora i just wanted to I'm going to push the book for you. Thank you. <laughs>